talking about something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about battery electrical modeling. Let's say I have a battery cell. I'm going to draw a cylindrical cell. It could be an entire pack, but let's start with a, just a single cell. And I'm going to connect it to a load. So I have some wires. I've connected to some sort of load. It could be constant current. It could be constant voltage, constant resistance, constant power. doesn't really matter. What I want to figure out is how much energy am I going to get into the load? What power levels can I do it at? What heat is going to be dissipated inside the battery? And can I write down all the electrical parameters of the system? Battery voltages, currents, load voltages, load powers. And how is this going to vary over temperature and time? So we're going to solve some really simple circuits and then learn about how batteries behave and draw some interesting graphs. So let's turn this into an electrical circuit model. The easiest battery model, which is wrong but useful, is as follows. We have an ideal battery with an internal resistance. And that is our battery model. And it goes to a load. Let's label some things. The battery, plus and minus, is VB. That's the internal ideal battery. The resistance is RB. The current flowing will be IL, I load. And then this is the power. The power, we'll call it P load. And then the output voltage is V load. How do we actually solve this? I want to be able to know everything going on here. I know my battery voltage. I know my internal resistance. But I want to give it a load and discover what the currents and voltages are. Let's start by drawing or writing up an energy balance. So we can say the energy leaving the battery is VB times IB. That's just you know, voltage times current equals power. The power dissipated in the resistor is I squared R, and we're losing that. It is leaving the electrical domain and entering the thermal domain. IB squared, sorry, IL squared RB. And that is equal to P load. Well, this is actually just a quadratic equation. We can rearrange this. Let me simplify a few terms here. We have IL squared times negative RB plus IB times VB plus minus P load equals zero. And that's the equation we want to solve for IL. So let's carry on over here. This is obviously our classic, you know, A, B, and C to be solved in a quadratic equation, which you've always wanted to see someone do live. So I load equals you know, negative B over 2A. And that is plus or minus. And I'll leave a little space here. Square root of B squared. minus 4 times A times C. And that's all over 2A. Cool. We can simplify some terms. That's just VB over 2RB. Uh, the minus here spins up on top. We get a minus plus. I promise you that's a real thing. And inside the radical, we get a VB squared minus 4RBPL. Okay, we want to move a few terms out because that VB squared is going to turn into a VB, which we can combine into these terms and simplify. So let's do a little bit of work here, and we're going to pull a VB out of the system. So we get I load equals VB over 2RB minus plus VB over 2RB. How did I do that? Well, if I pull VB squared out, I just get a 1. And here I get a minus 4 over RB PL VB squared. Okay. Um, last step, further combining, simplifying, combining terms. I load equals VB over 2RB times the quantity 1 minus plus, which is totally a real thing, 
1 minus 4 RB PL over ZB squared. Okay, this is our equation that matters here. And practically, if you're an engineer, you're going to be using the minus sign. And if you just want to make batteries, you want to move on, you can skip ahead because the next part is mostly for the electrical engineers and the physicists who want to understand a little bit more. Let's define a few quick definitions here. Um, I short circuit is the short circuit current of the battery. If I put zero ohms on the output, I'm going to get VB divided by RB. And then uh, V load is just VB minus IL RB, just a voltage drop. And then the power, the short circuit power, power short circuit developed inside the battery is the current short circuit current times you know, I squared R, and you end up with VB squared over RB. That's going to be something that matters. OK, let's look at the limits here. Um, clearly, we can't have imaginary currents. So inside the radical, this has to be positive. What happens when this happens to go right to 0 and we're on the edge of it being negative? Well, that's when 4 RB PL over VB squared equals 1 which means p load equals vb squared over 4 rb. That's interesting because that's actually one quarter of the short circuit power. That's going to be useful later. And then let's actually plot what we can actually do here. So two axes. And we're going to have current down here, IL. And it's going to go from 0 to short circuit current, which is VB over RB. And I'm going to do tick marks for, you know, this is like one quarter of the way, this is one half, and this is three quarters. But the scale is two short circuit. And then we're going to do power, P load. And the critical scale here goes up to power short circuit, VB squared over RB. Also going to put in tick marks for, you know, one half, one quarter, three quarters. What does this actually look like? How do we use this? Well, let's actually plot out a few, a few interesting areas. Um, when you're at zero power, you're at zero current. That makes sense to me. When you're at power equals one quarter of short circuit, if you plug that in, this radical turns to zero. So this whole area goes away. You get a one, and you end up with VB over 2RB, which is half the short circuit current. So Power load, one quarter, half short circuit current. Here's another interesting thing. If I actually short circuit the battery and I bring this to zero ohms, I'm getting a ton of current, but I'm getting no voltage. So technically, zero power is delivered to the load. It might seem a little bit strange, but you know, voltage times current. If the voltage is zero, the power is zero. So we actually get zero power again at short circuit. And I'll cut to the chase here. This equation is modeling a parabola here. And if you use the plus term, you'd get this sign. We don't use it very often for reasons I'll explain in just a moment. So what's, what's, what's going on up here? Um, the power dissipated, P dis, inside the battery is I L squared times R B, just I squared R. That is quadratic and current. So zero amps equals zero power dissipated. Makes sense to me. If you put in half of the short circuit, you will get one quarter. You will get uh, VB squared over RB divided by four. And if you put in full short circuit current, you will develop the full short circuit power inside of the cell from heat dissipation. And that is a parabola, which I'm going to screw up like this. This has some interesting uh, properties. So practically, we're only ever operating in this region. This is where we have low currents, we have low powers. That is where P load is actually pretty high compared to P dis. We don't want a lot of dissipation. We do want a lot of electrical power at the load. In this region, you know, P load is much higher than P dis. Therefore, we get good efficiencies. We're getting a lot out of the battery. It is extremely uncommon to operate past this point because it's literally diminishing returns. 
you are actually getting less electrical power out and you're consuming more current and you're consuming, you're dissipating a ton more power. This is really like an abuse situation of I'm going to short circuit my battery to see what it can do uh, either thermally by developing a ton of heat in it or electrically to like, you know, fuse things. So this is like not common or like abuse territory. This is common operation. The other interesting thing is if you remember like maximum power point, if you're drawing half of the short circuit current, you are developing the maximum power in the load, which is one quarter of short circuit power, but you're also developing an equal amount in the cell, which is like, you know, let's say you're doing 200 watts at the load, but also 200 watts thermally in the cell. That's a crazy load. Practically, we operate down here. Down here. Okay, so this is the kind of space you can actually be in in terms of power and current. If you're a mechanical engineer, you should show up again now. What do these curves actually look like? Like we have an equation and if I give you VB and RB for any power level, I can tell you what the current is and then I can solve the whole circuit. What do these curves actually look like? We're gonna draw the open circuit voltage curve for a battery. And I'm gonna define it in this specific way. This is V battery, which is in volts. And this is the state of charge, the vaunted SOC. Practically, I'm gonna write this as amp hours removed. Because I start at zero if I have a fully charged battery, and then I'll get to amp hours max when I have a fully discharged battery. So let's say you bought some 2170 cell, it's a five amp hour cell, fully charged at zero, and then at the very end, it's like five amp hours removed. Some people reverse the orientation of these axes, whatever. This is also known as state of charge. Amp hours is literally amps times hours. It's actually coulombs of charge. Volts is volts. This battery, you know, let's say this is a standard lithium battery. It's got a V max, call that 4.2 volts, and it's got a V min, call that 2.5 volts. If you're using lithium iron phosphate, you'll get slightly different numbers, but the, uh, the math is the same. The open circuit voltage curve is what happens when, if you have no load, meaning open circuit, if you put a multimeter on the battery, there is no current, which means there's no voltage drop, which means the internal battery voltage, VB, is presented at the terminals. That's why it's called open circuit. And you get some funky curve that looks like this. It drops off steeply at first, long, slow decline, and then it kind of rolls off. And it's usually about you know, 3.6 volts on average in the middle, and you'll see that on a lot of data sheets. This is the open circuit voltage curve. If you slowly discharge a battery, like very slowly, over the course of 10, 20, maybe 40 hours, you're doing a few milliamps, maybe tens of milliamps, there's almost no voltage drop, and you will start with a charge cell and slowly traverse all the way down to a discharge cell. You could actually then charge slowly all the way back, and you'd get this, uh, you know, two curves. You could take the average, you can find the open circuit voltage curve. What is the resistance look like? It is also as a function of SOC or amp hours removed from zero to amp hour max. And this is now resistance RB in ohms. And this is where things get a little more interesting. Your typical battery looks something like this. It's got this bathtub curve. However, you may get unlucky. Um, this is kind of the window you might see. Some cells, you might only see the front of the bathtub and it might peak up just a little bit at the end. Other cells, you might see the back of the bathtub and not the front. Some cells, you see both. In general, once you get to the extremes of either fully charged or fully discharged, the resistance tends to rise. But depending on the anode cathode like balance in the cell, you might not actually run into one of these peaks. The most important thing you should know here is that this is very temperature dependent. If you heat up the battery, your resistance will fall, which is actually quite desirable, hot. And if you cool down the battery, your resistances will rise, which is very undesirable. This is a little bit counterintuitive because people talk a lot about battery cooling. They're always mentioning that they want to keep their batteries colder, but on a per cycle basis, a warmer battery will have lower resistance. It will be able to deliver more power it'll actually be able to deliver more energy too. It'll be more efficient. However, over long periods of time, from an aging standpoint, hotter batteries will degrade faster, and that's the trade-off. There's other caveats such as you know, charging rapidly while cold 
is also very damaging to the battery, but discharging rapidly while cold, not so much. But essentially, the resistance of the battery is highly temperature dependent. How do we put this together? So let's, let's now cheat and draw a load voltage curve on top of our open circuit voltage curve. So we're still going to go from 0 to amp hour max. This is still amp hours. And now we're actually going to plot V load. And I'm going to, I'm going to put in the bounds for uh, VB, but we're going to draw deviations from it. So let's say you start at this operating point and you discharge. So you throw on a few amps of current, the voltage will fall. And then because you're discharging, you're going to be removing amp hours from the system and you'll slowly traverse this curve. And every time you can go around the loop, you can basically say, I started with this VB and that RB. I drew one amp, which is a certain amount of power, and I lost this voltage and then I move this amp hours, and then you can go back and say, let me continuously recalculate VB and RB as a function of amp hours. This is how you write a numerical solver to actually simulate your battery. Then if we stop discharging, we bounce back up. What is going on in the area underneath these curves? Well, it depends on what voltage you're looking at. This curve, VB, represents the battery internal voltage and guess what? Voltage times amp hours equals watt hours, which is energy. So this whole blue region represents energy that left the battery, E battery. However, the voltage at the load was lower than the voltage at the battery. So naturally, less energy got to it. This pink region represents energy at the load. What is the difference? Well. This is the voltage drop across the resistor. This represents graphically the energy dissipated in the resistor to make this happen. So this little region up here is E dis. And if you look at the sizes of these blocks, you can basically figure out what the efficiency is. You know, this is like, I don't know, 80% efficient in terms of energy uh, output versus energy total. We can do the same thing for charge. Let's say we start at this point and we charge the battery. So now current is going the other direction. The load is a higher voltage than the battery because it's stuffing current into the battery. So therefore the voltage rise. Oops. Then because we're putting current in, we are actually putting amp hours back in. We traverse it this way. We stop. Then we turn off the power. We go back down here. What's happened here? Well, this time our load had a higher voltage than our battery. So the pink region is E load. However, not all of that made it into the battery. Like the battery was only at this voltage the whole time. So it's thinking it got a different amount of energy. Again, E battery. And you guessed it, that top region is you know, a voltage rise instead of a voltage drop, but it's still energy dissipated. And as you're charging, um, you know, energy is still dissipated by the difference between you know, the load voltage and the battery voltage as we push amp hours into it. So this is a graphical way of looking at um, the way energy flows inside of a battery. There's a lot more you can do with this load voltage versus amp hour curve, and I'll get to that in a later video, but you can quickly justify why constant current and constant voltage charging is used and how under aggressive discharges you can't get all the energy out that you wanted to but this is already enough battery modeling for one day